Now, I'm going to speak about the people who are deliberately seeking to destroy our planet through climate change. I'll come back to what I mean by that. And in the second half, I'm going to try and give you some suggestions from my work as to how we can stop them. So I became interested in climate change through studying international security and global governance. Now, three things became clear to me during this time. One, that the peace that we all enjoy is very precarious and can easily be lost. Secondly, when this peace breaks down, the level of human suffering is immense. And thirdly, that climate change is, as the Pentagon called it, a threat multiplier. And what this means is it exacerbates key causes of conflict and war, such as drought, water shortages, food shortages, mass movements of people. Now this here is a picture of a Syrian refugee trying to get into Turkey and being blocked. Now, climate change, the war in Syria is not caused by climate change, but it is recognized as one of the first major conflicts where climate change was a key contributor through a drought. The reality is that we have, as the IPCC says, 12 years in which we have to halve global emissions. And if we do not achieve this, the changes to our climate will be so extreme that it could cause the breakdown of our whole civilization. We have no means, we know of no way in which we can cool down the planet. At some point, there are those that might try to move to block the sun's radiation. I suggest to you, if we reached this point, we would have already lost. There were also during this period, or after, a number of irreversible feedback loops that could occur as a result of the warming. And what I mean by this, for example, if the Arctic tundra thaws, it will release a massive bomb of methane, which will cause the climate to accelerate out of control. I suggest if this happens, we would have also have lost. Now, if you're not annoyed about this, I think you should be, because this is not an accident. This is not new information. It is rather the deliberate consequence of a small number of powerful men in North America and Europe who have over the last 30 years decided to rather destroy the world than surrender any of their wealth, power or privilege. Now how many of you know who this man is? Not many nods. His name is Robert Mercer. He was a key funder of the Donald Trump campaign. He also interfered with Brexit through Cambridge Analytica. He also uses his vast wealth to fund climate change denial. He is one such man I am referring to. I am also referring to the leadership of ExxonMobil and the leadership of the North American and German car companies which would rather subvert and cheat our emission standards than allow us to have clean air. And just like how any good dictatorship always has enough people to repress their populations, I am referring to their stooges. I am referring to the think tanks that disseminate misinformation about the science of climate change in order to confuse the public. I am referring to the lobbyists that work night and day in London, in Brussels, in Washington, in Canberra to chip away 
at the legislation we need to survive. And what really annoys me about this last group is that they are clever people. They go to good universities like the LSE. They have degrees in law and public policy. They come from good homes. They probably have mothers that love them. Yet they choose to use their privilege to undermine the policies that we need to survive. Now, why do I say that this is deliberate? Because it's one thing for an oil company to sell you a product. You buy it and you legitimize the further extraction of it. Then once, the, once we get to the, if they then, the difference is we now know that the oil companies and their product will cause harm to the world. It becomes deliberate though when they try and deny the harm that their product is doing. There has been no, there has been no serious environmental problem in the modern era that has been solved without legislation. The policies that we need now are really the last lifeboat on the Titanic. And if you are sitting on this metaphorical lifeboat and you are kicking a hole here and you are removing a panel here, denying that ship sink, then what you are doing is clearly deliberate and it's clearly destructive. Now, I don't know if we can stop people like Robert Mercer, but we, we the people, can change the global corporations. And we need to, because we need to stop companies such as BP from just last year spending $13 million to undermine a carbon tax in the state of Washington. And this is the company which is supposedly a sustainability leader that supports the price on carbon. So I'm going to suggest three ways in which we might be able to stop these people. But firstly, I'm going to suggest two ways in which uh, w things that may not work. So some of you may think that you can affect climate by going to work for a company like BP. I'm going to say to you, it is not going to work. There is not enough time. There is not enough time for you to enter a major global corporation and change its strategy in time for climate change. It's not going to happen and you're probably just going to end up working for the other side. The second thing I said suggest is not going to work. My business partner said to me once, strategically, no one cares what you think. Now, he does have a way with words. But what he meant by that is that my moralistic arguments may play well in a politics seminar, but they don't necessarily play well if you're in the business of trying to influence a global industrial corporation. So sometimes you have to speak a different language to influence different partners. And this leads to my first suggestion, is that if you can use the power of data and you can present evidence objectively and keep your opinion out of it, it becomes very difficult for the other side to argue against you. And I'll give you an example. The International Maritime Organization was charged in Kyoto, Kyoto 1997 with regulating the GHG emissions of the shipping industry. Now, 22 years later, they had succeeded in producing no such regulation over 22 years, which is longer than the space race from start to end. Now, the reason is because they, anyone who cared to know knew that they were a corporate captured entity. But the problem is people didn't have the evidence to prove it. So what my organization Influence Map did is empirically prove that the corporations were in the committees proposing most of the legislation 
amending their own legislation and then voting on the legislation on behalf of nation states where there should have been national delegates. And I can tell you, the shipping industry were pretty angry with us. They wrote articles calling us, or calling our work nonsense. Someone said to me, everybody hates you, but no one knows who you are. It was perfect. <laughs> But the point is, because I had kept my opinion out of it, they didn't really have an argument. The second suggestion I would like to impart is there's a key opportunity to use the financial system to serve our own interests. Now, let me break this down a little bit. If you go into the world of work, you will get a pension fund. And this money and any savings you have or may inherit or not inherit, will likely be managed by an institutional investor, such as a pension fund, such as BlackRock, which will put the money into the global financial system. Okay. Now, this institutional investor has a fiduciary duty, a legal responsibility to ensure that your best interests are being served. But your best interests are not being served if your money is being put into a company which is actively seeking to destroy the climate change legislation that we need to survive. And that investor is doing nothing to change the behavior of that company. He is, he is clearly in breach of his legal obligations. They're formed recently a investor coalition representing $33 trillion to engage just on climate change, to engage with the worst companies on climate change. And one of the issues they're engaging on is the lobbying activities of these companies. My company, Influence Map, provides them with data. The opportunity here, as I see it, is whilst there are some institutional investors, such as the Church of England, which are bringing shareholder resolutions against the bad companies, not enough is being done at the moment. But if we, the people, who collectively own the money and collectively own the corporations, if we worked together and cleverly, we could overthrow any CEO or overthrow the entire board of any publicly traded company which was seeking to destroy the planet. Our money is important, but it's not enough. We need, as ever, more democratic pressure. Climate change is a failure of democracy. It's a failure of us to take control of the mechanisms through which we can restrict the corporations. It's a failure because we have allowed, we have allowed those to profit from destroying the planet. However, it becomes very difficult for the lobbyists to undermine policy when outside the window there is a mass movement. It is very difficult for them to undermine policy when there are young people refusing to reproduce an economic system that no longer serves your interests. It becomes more difficult when 16-year-old um, Swedish girls such as Greta Thunberg refuse to attend school until her government takes climate change seriously. We have little time left, very little time, but there is still an opportunity to stop these people. We must stop these people. And I think, I think what we have now is the start of a movement to do so. Thank you.